I think it's quite obvious at this point, but right now, Sergio Perez needs to win the next two races, and Max has to DNF in both races for Checo to keep his seat. But if it makes him feel any better, it might not necessarily be Daniel Ricciardo replacing him at Red Bull, it could easily be someone else, and the entire Red Bull order could be about to completely and cataclysmically change. Six months ago, the Red Bull lineup looked pretty simple and boring, and there was no real sign of a major upheaval going down. Max was locked in for several years. I mean, unless he took a look at the 2026 Red Bull car and essentially went, ooh. Checo was in Christian's good books after getting Red Bull's first clean sweep ever. Yuki was being Pierre Gasly 2.0, and Daniel was, um, really charming the sponsors to great effect. And he also did enough to ensure AlphaTauri weren't lost, so yeah, even Helmut Marco couldn't argue with the fact that he had brought an extra 20 million dollar dues their way. Now this video is a continuation of the sorts of the video I made last week, about that supposed filming day that Liam Lawson was taking part in, and that potentially being a deciding factor as to who was going to be sitting next to Max Verstappen this year and next. Almost a year after the infamous test that saw Nick DeVries being dropped and Daniel put in as Ricardo's lap times unofficially were compelling enough when compared to Max. And as far as Christian Horner was concerned, that was good enough for him, so he got the seat next to Yuki Tsunoda at AlphaTauri and the rest of 2023 is history. Fast forward to now and Liam Lawson was given a chance to drive the RB20 and lay down some times, which were apparently two tenths slower than their set benchmarks compared to Max Verstappen. Yeah, you might think that this is a blow for Liam Lawson, that he's too slow, he's not going to get a chance at Red Bull, and he's going to have to try and find his luck as a free agent elsewhere. Well, hold your horses there, it gets a little bit more complicated, and there is another test to be had which might be more representative, here's why. You see, according to the guidelines set out by F1 and Pirelli, specific tyres for filming days are provided, rather than using compounds you'd find in a typical Grand Prix, or even an official tyre manufacturer tyre test. Also, the amount of time that Liam spent on track would have been drastically less than any other driver would have gotten during an official tyre test, or an official test in general. You only get 200 kilometres of driving per day. That's about, according to calculations, 33 laps or so of the Silverstone track. But remember, most of that time might not be dedicated to do all-out lap times, which would also be unrepresentative due to the less-than-great performance of the rubber. You also got to figure in drone shots, still shots, pulling away, coming to a stop, anything that sponsors may want in terms of using for their own advertisements or campaigns, they got to do. They got a checklist in which Liam Lawson is going to be driving the RB20. It's just an experience in that type of car. So you can't really compare it wholesale to what Daniel Ricciardo was doing, because he got to do the whole day in that car. Other people were doing tyre tests that day for Pirelli. Alex Albon, for example, in the Williams, he managed to clock about 86 laps or so. Which is why I'm not ruling out Liam Lawson just yet, as he has another test on the cards in the AT03 of 2022, at the beginning of August, at the Emilia Romagna circuit. The benchmark for him would be Tsunoda's lap time from practice 2 from 2022 over 1 minute 20.3. If he cannot match that, or be at least a few tenths quicker than that, then there might be some red flags from Liam Lawson's career Red Bull. And if he turns out to be slow at that test as well, maybe that might give Sergio Perez a reprieve. Or would it? Or maybe his fate is effectively sealed because there might be other plans going on down below. I don't think you need reminding about the performance clauses in Checo's contract, but the clauses in other Red Bull driver contracts offer some clues as to where things might go if Helmut Marko gets his way, and Christian Horner has to comply. Basically, at the moment, Red Bull are in a bit of a quandary as to what are they going to do for the next year or two when it comes to their drivers. Sure, they could easily stay the course of what they got right now and just make do, but it is getting a lot of fan blowback, and it is seriously compromising their chances when it comes to the Constructors title. It's not what the fans reckon is the biggest prize. The team prize was boring. Who's the driver's champion? Well, we all know who that's gonna be. And even though Liam Lawson had a good run with AlphaTauri last year, he still wasn't quite enough to shove Daniel Ricciardo to the benches. That not being helped with the V-Car brand CEO Peter Bayer stating that Dietrich Mateschitz modus operandi for the second Red Bull, and that instead being what the shareholders potentially might want, to have two profitable teams two competitive teams as well, trying to get that fifth place slot in the constructors using any means necessary in terms of showing parts, intel, whatever they can get away with to try and make sure they can best the likes of Aston Martin, Haas, Alpine, Williams, what have you. It was all about performance and hitting targets, going against the principles set by Mateschitz in the first place when he got into F1, as part of his passion for motorsport rather than just making money. Because it was a gamble, he knew it. He was already forking out tons of cash for getting Adrian Newey's services on board, and having to pay more than he would have liked to originally when he acquired Jaguar. Yes, I know the symbolic transaction was a pound, 
but that was also with the condition of spending hundreds of millions of dollars in investing in the team. Simply put, post Mattershits, Red Bull wanted that team to make money and not call controversy. And therefore, in the process, it's kind of made the team sterile and them having to rely on the personalities of their drivers to make do. However, it seems more likely now that the shareholders and Peter Bear have suddenly taken a step back and seen sense. The original mission of this team is to help foster junior talent and help keep the Red Bull junior train rolling. Which, thanks to this report from Alto Motor and Sport, might be signaling a change from what we have seen in the last few years when they're happy to take drivers from outside of the pool bring back the ones that had left on their own volition and have remained popular and instead actually fostered and taken care of and considered the people that are in the junior formulae and are doing quite well any of the junior drivers that survived the major call of 2023 their future looks more bright now with the f2 grid last year having several red bull junior drivers and now it cut down to just two in isaac hajar and pepe marti far more manageable. And even though Red Bull have actually been better than they were last year in regards to the downturn in Checker's performance, they are still making hints and clues as to the direction of where Checker is going. And the supposed leak of these performance clauses do not help matters. Even though Helmut Marco has been doing his best to hold his tongue when it comes to Sergio Perez, but the damage has already been done. 2023 was what began the fan movement against Perez as it stands today. Because you had relatively little criticism about him in 2021 and 2022, with the only controversy that year surrounding that Monaco crash. Checo otherwise was simply doing his job. 2023 though was brutal, no driver should have to go through that. Checo was put through the ringers after what Helmut Marko was doing and was only tempered when Helmut Marko went too far. But the damage was done. Red Bull had manifested all this negativity towards Sergio Perez and there was no stopping it. It was just going to continue. The only way it would stop is if Checo got results, got wins, got consistent podiums, which he was doing at the beginning of the year, but now he isn't anymore. All of that noise comes back it's all on Red Bull and what Christian Horner helped manifest. He should have nipped that in the bud with Helmut Marko right when it started. But yes, we do have to consider that that is in the past and we really need to consider about the here and now. Because Checo has made the most of the lack of pressure when it comes to replacements other than Daniel Ricciardo, and with him not exactly setting the world light at V-Card with Yuki Tsunoda seemingly being ignored as well, Sergio could breathe a sigh of relief, as Max was doing all the heavy lifting in the team battle as well. Well, here's the issue. Max can't really do that anymore. He is winging the neck of the RB20 just to hold his own and maintain his 80 plus point lead in the Drivers' Championship. He can't really do much else when it comes to the team title. Checo really has to step up and pull his weight. I know you might be thinking I'm being anti-Checo, but that, that's facts. Regardless of whoever is in that second seat, they need to pull their weight with Red Bull if they want to win the Constructors' Championship again. And with Checo struggling to get into Q3 on a regular basis, that, 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 that's just too much. And you can also tell that Perez has had trouble really integrating himself into the Red Bull fold. Whenever you see any social media posts or funny little videos that Red Bull does or interviews and what have you, he just looks isolated and out of place, like he's not fully immersed in the Red Bull culture. And then this was capitalized even further during the Goodwood Festival of Speed, as well as the Thursday press conference at Silverstone, where Checo was right there and no one asked him any questions, people more interested in the other drivers present. Chandok talking about hypothetical teams in other sports, even DC and Weber got more coverage than Checo did. Something's going on behind the scenes, and I think Checo is on the way out, because you're seeing what's going on with Magnussen at the moment, him now just being confirmed to be leaving Haas at the end of the year. This entire year, he's just looked off. And the fact that he's had this laissez-faire attitude when it comes to penalty points, you know that something in the background was brewing. And then also, Yuki Tsunoda driving his RB18, Checo's RB18, up the Goodwill Hill climb, that was also kind of foreshadowing as well. Although, let's temper that, because... No other Red Bull driver was available. Yuki wasn't scheduled to drive a Red Bull F1 car. He was just present because he was driving old Honda cars. So that's why he didn't have his race gear. He was driving that modern F1 car in 60s racing goggles, which looked pretty cool, but also showed that at the same time, Red Bull are kind of overlooking this potential talent, especially in a year where he is maturing although he is letting slip a couple of times. But things might be about to change for the Japanese driver and the Mexican driver, and this is where things get really interesting. And I apologize for taking my time to get this point in the video. I just wanted to provide full context for you and all of the information I had so you were well informed. And if you liked what I provided you and shared with you, maybe drop a like on this video and give a cheeky subscribe. 
Cheers. With even Red Bull's chief engineer, Paul Monaghan, candidly admitting to F1's Beyond the Grid that Checo is at least half a second slower than Max on average, he even knew that Checo wouldn't like this being shared in public because he said if Checo were in the same room, he'd probably be giving him a death glare. Alto Motor and Sport have reported there's a potential overhaul of the Red Bull driver lineup in the offing, which could see the Red Bull Junior team suddenly come back to life after years of stagnation. And ultimately, it could provide the likes of Arvid Lindblad an opportunity if they really want to fast track him into Formula 1 and then potentially provide a sixth British-born F1 driver in the sport. And I know that people who don't like the British side of F1, they're gonna love Love that. Although I don't see the point of what Mercedes were trying to do in getting Kimi Antonelli in early, considering that his 18th birthday is in a couple of weeks, so all of that talk about getting special dispensation was all for nothing. It was a bit of a waste of time, actually, but, you know, Red Bull will profit from it, at least. Basically, the plan is reportedly to not stick Liam Lawson in the RB21 next to Max next year, or even Daniel Ricciardo, for that matter. Instead, V-Carb would have a different lineup for 2025, in the New Zealander having his contract being honoured, and Isaac Hajar in the seat next to him. Now, you might be thinking and going, wait, hang on, Hajar? Isn't he just like Yuki Tsunoda and having a really bad temper, but even worse? Well, yeah, he, yeah, he has been known for his outbursts, especially the one in Monaco this year, where a virtual safety car cost him a potential win on effectively home soil, and Zach O'Sullivan got that plum. Yeah, that was tragic, but he did let loose extremely. Yes, admittedly, he is quite the hothead, and his antics in FP1 at Silverstone didn't help when he almost took out Lando Norris when he wasn't paying attention. Yeah, I know that there are some growing pains for brand new drivers, especially F2 drivers in FP1 sessions as an F1, but that would have been an almighty gaffe, especially considering that Zach Brown is on the warpath with Red Bull. That would have just given him extra ammunition. And yeah, he was apologetic about nearly hitting Norris, but yeah, he also got 19th, so it wasn't a great opening gambit. But you know, the championship is still there for the taking. He is in charge of that, he does have three wins to his name as well. Although admittedly the F2 grid this year is a little bit all over the place with the car's teething trouble seriously skewing the order, this year Hajar has genuinely kicked on in terms of his junior career because you look back over the last couple of years and it's been okay. He's had a couple of third places in championships, mostly fourths and fifths. It's similar to what Paul Aaron's been going through and him having an okay junior career, albeit better than Hajar, and then suddenly coming alive in F2, yet Mercedes chose to drop him anyway. I still find that completely bizarre. But hey, don't worry, Paul Aaron is getting an opportunity with expensive eye APX GP for this year. So yeah, hopes for Paul Aaron's future career in F1 with that team. Yes, I know that account is fake, but I don't care. I'm having fun with it, as should you. Just lighten up. However, Red Bull did stick by the Frenchman, and he survived the cull, unlike the Estonian Mercedes, who is now doing better than the current Mercedes favourite. And with Pepe Marti almost 100 points behind the other Red Bull F2 junior, Hajar's really on course to maybe get his F1 chance soon. That is, of course, he finishes fourth or higher in the championship, because when it comes to the current super license point that he's got, I think it's about 15 for his fourth place in F3, He's really got it all to do, because if he just completely falls off in the second half of the F2 season, then he's probably going to have to do another year, and then Red Bull will have to think of something else. And that might provide Checo a little bit of breathing space. The next part of this report, talking about the V-card thing about Lawson and Hajar, it then says at Red Bull, it won't be Daniel Ricciardo replacing Sergio Perez, but instead, Yuki Tsunoda getting that chance after four years with the second team. Because like I said, Yuki Tsunoda has translated into the new Pierre Gasly in that, oh, he's really good at that second team. Oh, everyone loves him there. He's a great leader there. So why he changed the status quo? He's doing well there. Maybe he might not do so well at Red Bull, but come on, it's just getting ridiculous at this point. All Red Bull juniors get a chance, or at least they used to. Pierre Gasly got his chance. Alex Albon got his chance. Heck, Daniel Ricciardo got his chance back in the day. So why not Yuki? Because it's just getting ridiculous at this point that he's been constantly overlooked, even though he has steadily improved. He's done his time. Yeah, that's all very well and good. But Ricardo doesn't figure in this brand new plan at all, or at least not directly. We all know how ruthless and sudden Red Bull can be with contracts, and whilst Checo is seemingly destined to either stay at Red Bull for as long as Christian Horner would allow, or be cast out to find sanctuary elsewhere or into retirement, if this report is accurate, Daniel seemingly might be treated like Albon was after it was clear he was out of Red Bull's main lineup for 2021. Yeah, he got to spend some time on the side in DTM as well as being Red Bull's reserve driver, and then he got that plum being on loan to Williams for 2022, and thusly getting a second chance in Formula 1. And thanks to this report, I think the same thing will happen with Daniel Ricciardo. Daniel Ricciardo's done a lot for Red Bull over the years, and to get him back was nice, and the opportunity was there, but it simply wasn't to be. So Christian Horner wouldn't want to throw him back out to the streets again. He didn't do that in the first place. So instead, he might come up with a compromise, do everything in his power like he did with Albon to try and find him a seat elsewhere on the Formula 1 grid. And so far, according to this report, it's not really been that successful. 
Apparently Sauber and Audi were mentioned, but you got to remember, Andreas Seidel's in charge there, and he was around when Daniel Ricciardo was at McLaren, and he would know exactly what was going on with Daniel, so that's a hard pass. So maybe all of that stuff I mentioned in a video a couple of weeks ago about him being potentially in negotiations with Williams might come to reality, especially when you're considering that Carlos Sainz is dithering and James Valls is really hardening up regarding that, and that his team is not going to be a place where drivers will stop off for a couple of years before moving on. James Valls taking real exception to that. Not to mention that Valtteri Bottas is right there, keen to take an F1 drive with both hands, and apparently he's been having secret meetings with Williams, as seen at the British Grand Prix supposedly when he was trying to be incognito. Good luck with that mullet. And then of course, that whole little anecdote where he was saying, oh, the Salba team ran out of coffee, so I went to an old friend to get some coffee instead. I mean, we all know that Bottas likes his espressos, but at the same time, come on, Valtteri. Yeah, right. Mate. You seriously think the hospitality department would run out of coffee like that? Coffee is what keeps people going in that sport. So if Bottas does get that seat at Williams instead of Ricardo, Ricardo might just have to make do as being the Red Bull reserve. In case something bad happens or Yuki leaves after one year, he can then fill in the gap perhaps. But I think it might not lead to a full-time drive at this rate. So I don't see anything wrong with this plan. Just give Yuki a chance in 2025, even if it's only for a year. Because, I mean, come on, Pierre at least got 10 races to have a shot and it didn't work out for him, but at least he had a go. Reward the Japanese driver for his services with a go in the fast car. Allow the youngsters a chance in the sister car, and perhaps that might re-energize the top team. And yeah, okay, fine, even if it doesn't work out and Yuki goes to another team in 2026, maybe Aston Martin with the Honda connection, who knows, he still has the opportunity to become the most successful Japanese F1 driver in history. And it's a rare opportunity for a Japanese driver to be with a front-running team. The last time I think I can recall was Paka Masato back in 2004 when he was racing for BAR. Yeah. BAR in 2004 were like effectively the second best team with Button and Sato. Sato got a podium at the American Grand Prix and he's also had a pretty good career in IndyCar. So, you know, Takuma Sato, don't discount him. He's really good. Probably one of the best Japanese drivers alongside Kanui Kobayashi. So should Tsunoda move on, or maybe Max moves on if he sees fit to do so, because his contract says he can do that should he not want to be with Red Bull anymore, then maybe Yuki could lead the team, Lawson could then be promoted as well, and then that means the F3 driver Arvid Lindblad could then get into V-Car for 2026 if he nails his F2 rookie season, or maybe Pepe Marti steps up next year. You see what I mean here? Even though Helmut Marko might be losing out in terms of the Red Bull power struggle, Christian Horner winning out, Marko might get his way after all, because the options that Christian Horner wants to keep around, Sergio Perez and Daniel Ricciardo, are not setting the world alight, and it is giving the Red Bull management cause for concern. I know you might be thinking I'm blowing this out of proportion, that everything's fine at Red Bull, and that Zach Brown is trying to destabilize the team from outside of the fold. But the fact of the matter is, though, things aren't looking as solid at Red Bull as they were at the beginning of the year, before all of the allegations regarding Horner came to light. And even though Horner tried to alleviate Checo's worries with a premature contract extension, and maybe reward the Mexican for his loyalty during that turbulent period, it's not worked. Something's got to give. And supposing if Daniel gets the chance to have a go in the Red Bull car for the rest of the year, if they decide to drop Checo after the summer break, and he doesn't really impress, and Red Bull go on to lose the Constructors' Championship, then... Horner can't rely on his old faithfuls anymore. They have to step aside for the new blood to come in. Ultimately, Marco will win the battle, even though it might take a more roundabout way to get there. And also, posthumously, honour the legacy of Dietrich Mateschitz. And that means Red Bull can go back to what they were doing so well in the 2010s, populating the F1 grid, be it with their current Red Bull drivers or ones that move on to other teams to find their luck on their own, and generally trying to increase the quality of the grid. Yeah, okay, I get that, Law, but can you just go back and elaborate on that whole williams ricardo partnership thing? Because I'm really intrigued about that. Well, I was too when that potential news dropped, or gossip, or what have you. But I think if that were to be true, and Daniel did get that deal with Horner's help, that might be actually a plum deal considering where Williams might be going in the new regulation era. Something I've discussed more about in detail in this video here that you can go and watch right now, and I'll shall see you there. <laughs>